Hola a todos, how we doing? Welcome to our next P, Price. It's a biggie. P has a significant role in the marketing mix, particularly because P sends a signal. P is very salient, the price P. I keep saying P, what I mean is price. You know, when we think about goods and services, we tend to talk about them in terms of price pretty quickly in the conversation. That's why we say it's one of the most important factors. Another way to think about price is the give-get ratio. You know, when we think about if we want a product or a service, if there is something that we want to purchase, we have a need or we have a want, we're looking for the benefits of what we're going to get out of that. But then, how much, how much am I willing to pay or sacrifice? How many dead presidents, we like dead presidents in our wallet, right? How many dead presidents are we willing to give up in order to get what we want? Sometimes we feel we paid a little bit and got a lot. There was a lot of value for us. The give-get ratio was very much in our favor. The give-get ratio better be at least even in our heads because the last thing we want is cognitive dissonance where we give-get ratio is negative inside our heads. All right, when we talk about pricing, we tend to talk about pricing, and there's like five different ways that we can think about coming up with pricing concepts. And five Cs, we can talk about competitive pressure, cost pressure, company objectives, consumer or customer pressure, and then also maybe some pressure from our channel members. First, let's think about company objectives. You know, there are some companies that have a profit-oriented objective when it comes to pricing, meaning my margins have to be at least 18%. My margins have to be at least 20%. Otherwise, we're not going to sell this product. If we can't put this in the marketplace and get our, give ourselves at least a 20% margin on stuff we sell, then we're not going to participate. I mean, Apple is a very good company or a very good example at this kind of mentality, they don't do anything with at least 30% margin. And many of their products are between, are much closer to 35% margin, you know. There are some companies that have a very sales-oriented pricing objective, okay? They set prices very, very low because they want volume. In the process of volume, they get to really take sales away from competitors even if profits suffer a bit, but then they might find other ways to generate revenue as opposed to just pure sales. Walmart is a particularly good example of this. Competitor-oriented pricing. You know, we may set prices really, really low to keep competition out. Okay? It's less about creating new revenue and more about putting pressure on competition. Finally, we have customer-oriented pricing. We may target a specific segment, a very high value product, and we will price relatively high. We call this premium pricing for a particular target segment. Okay? I don't think all customer-oriented pricing has to be premium, by the way. But the idea of having a particular price target in mind for a particular customer segment, you know, finding that sweet spot for a particular customer segment, there you go, customer-oriented pricing. Another way to think about pricing is customer, particularly demand, and here's our downward sloping demand curves. You know, you would think you would get more demand if the price drops. So this is the original price. We drop the price to, you know, 10 from 15. 
and therefore we get higher demand. The quantity goes from 5 to 10. You know? Standard econ theory 101. So when we talk about demand curves, please note that not all demand curves are downward sloping. As a matter of fact, for luxury goods, demand curves tend to be um, have a, a double slope. Okay, in other words, the higher the price goes, the more demand there might be for it. Okay, that does not demean quantity explicitly, but you see how we can move from here and increase, you know, here we can increase price, you know. Um, there's also, it doesn't necessarily just price, but um, there's a weird case called Geffen goods in economics. Scarcity is part of the reason why we can change the downward sloping demand curve. I think I'll probably leave it at that. Let's do some more detail here and talk a little bit about elasticity of demand. Okay, elastic, just the way we see a whole bunch of rubber bands in this image here, elastic, think stretchy, think price sensitive, meaning if you change price either up or down, the consumer population will be sensitive to that price change. Okay, this tends to happen in highly competitive marketplaces. This tends to happen with goods that are commonly used every day. And if you drop price, we should see a spike in demand. If you raise price, you'll probably see demand drop a bit. These are elastic price sensitive categories, product classes. Inelastic, meaning it's not price sensitive. These tend to be things like utilities. You know, we can't use more electricity even if the price goes down. We only use what we need. Right. Uh, also, medicine. You know, medicines. If the price goes up, we still need the medicine because it's part of our prescription. It's part of what we need to stay alive. We do what we can to still buy the medicine. If the price drops, it's not like we buy more of the medicine because we can still only can take one pill per day. These are inelastic consumers that are not sensitive to price change or product examples that are not sensitive to price change. Another way to think about pricing is to think about costs. Okay, There are variable costs, there are fixed costs, and there are total costs. Total cost is top line, it, you know. Revenue, we talk about top line revenue, and then we have costs. Some are fixed, some are variable. Variable costs change with the amount of production. Okay, You need to buy more materials to make more shirts. Fixed costs, regardless of the amount of shirts you made, you still have to pay the same mortgage payment for the plant. These are our total costs. And then when we think about break even, we look at our total revenue top line. This is how many units we sell and how much they cost per unit. We have to subtract our total costs, fixed and variables, and we get margin. Hopefully it's in the black. We like black. Black means profitable. Now, although break-even analysis is one way, we sometimes you can't always think about profitability. Sometimes you think you have to build a marketplace. And a good example of this, in the year 2000, Toyota introduced the Prius, and it was ugly. It was not a pretty car, and it was expensive. They were $20,000 a piece at the time, which was about $4,000 more per... $4,000 more per Corolla, and about twenty-five, about $2,000 more than a Camry. So you're paying more for a smaller, uglier car. Now to make matters worse at 20 grand, here's the hard part. Toyota lost $8,000 per car in the year 2000. $8,000 they lost per car. It cost them 28,000. They knew they couldn't charge $28,000 at break even because guess what? 
If you charge $28,000, which was only $3,000 from the price of a Lexus at $31,000 at the time, you know, they're not going to develop a market. The market is never going to get created. The batteries were very expensive back then. Toyota took a bath on the Prius because they needed to introduce the brand, they needed to introduce the concept, and they needed to master the technology of hybrid. And they lost $8,000 per car in Prius Edition 1. They lost about $3,000 in the second model year. Not the second model year, the second model type. So 2000 to 2004 was the original Prius. And then 2004, I'm getting my dates wrong, was like the second model type. By the third model type, they were making about $1,200 per car. And by that time also, they had mastered the hybrid technology and they had learned how to use it and distribute it across not only the Toyota brand, uh, but also the Lexus brand. And no company makes more hybrid cars than Toyota in this day and age. So you could say, okay, we may have lost $8,000 per car at first, but eventually all our hybrid cars became very, very profitable. Uh, another one is competition. You know, so this is making a marketplace. I told you that story specifically when we were talking about making a marketplace. But at the same time, we also have to think about monopolies, where there is no competition, oligopolies, where a very, very small set of firms have control of the market. Pure competition when there is many many firms many many consumers popular uh, you know popular product lines and then we have monopolistics okay so here utility companies oligopoly airline companies there's only three pure uh, think about soft drinks there's tons of competition and tons of ways monopolistic competition is the hard one we have many firms selling different energy products at different prices. So it's similar but different products. Um, what would be a good example of this? Hold on, let me come up with one in a second. Um, I wonder if we could consider consumer batteries monopolistic kind of competition. Or probably clothing. Clothing's probably a better example because we need clothes. They're selling similar but different products. You know, maybe you don't get the dress, but you get the blouse and a pair of pants from a competitor. Um, finally, and we will talk more about this when we talk about the supply chain management or the place P, but channel members influence price. Channel members need a cut. Channel members protect against um, markets that are illegally run. We call them gray market transactions. You know, we have to be in line with the manufacturer, the wholesale, and the retailers need to keep all the product within the channel so no product leaves the channel, which goes to a gray market kind of a scenario. Um, but the channel members influence price. The more channel members there are, the higher the price is going to be because each channel member has to make money. In today's day and age, we have this thing called the internet and we are disintermediating, meaning getting rid of channel members. There are fewer channel members in today's day and age than there has been ever. Uh, some macro influence on pricing. I probably spoke about the internet too soon. You know, we have more ways as consumers to search for price. Think about buying a car 10 years ago. You know, it was very difficult to find out how much things cost. Now you can pretty much know exactly how much that dealer paid for that particular car before you even walk onto the lot. As a matter of fact, it is significantly easier to buy a car digitally than non-digitally. Uh, most of the major manufacturers have apps. Um, we are more price sensitive now because we can cross price and cross shop much easier than in the past. And then also we have different 
types of pricing models um, the Groupon model the eBay model um, you know sorry about that some other things that influence price uh, economic factors you know sometimes local conditions sometimes uh, impact exactly what pricing would be either high or low and in certain parts of the country the price is X and other parts of the country the price is Y some of that may be due to shipping costs too by the way but a lot of it might be because of local economies like go to IHOP in San Francisco go to IHOP in Maine uh, in San Francisco the IHOP I, I couldn't believe it we we're paying like 18 to 20 dollars a person in IHOP in San Francisco you know things are just very expensive there because in San Francisco there is a lot more disposable income compared to other parts of the country maybe like upstate New York um, cross shopping so the ability for us to be able to check pricing you know we might cross shop we might probe further globalization means competition globalization means uh, products coming in from other parts of the country, ease of distribution, um, increased competitiveness. Uh, some people are more into status um, and they want to use goods and services as a signaling device. You know, these impact pricing. Perhaps even more, and this is on the consumer side, you know, if we think about pricing strategies or theories or ideas in the last 30 years, the internet certainly has been significant, but the other most significant one is ELDP, Everyday Low Pricing, pretty much pioneered by Walmart. Although it existed before, no one went to the level or the extent that Walmart did when it came to Everyday Low Pricing. You know, Walmart wants you to go to Walmart, and Walmart wants you to confidently feel that, you know something, I am probably paying the lowest price you possibly can for this good or service. Now, high-low pricing is more traditional retailing, where at the beginning of the month, goods are full price. At the beginning of the fashion season, goods are full price. And eventually they get slowly discounted, and then there's a discount bin of stuff that's going out of style or out of the season towards the end, and they're trying to blow it out. So they try to capture as much margins as they can at the beginning, and then towards the end, they just try to get rid of merchandise to get some kind of return, maybe break even on the clothing. That's high-low pricing. High-low pricing still is, I would say, more than two-thirds of the overall market. Very few firms are complete everyday low pricing. Um, quality price relationship this goes back to our give get re ratio you know we expect higher price equals higher quality you could send a signal there higher price equals higher quality we have that kind of relationship when we talk about pricing too there are two dominant models when it comes to pricing we can talk about skimming and we can talk about market penetration pricing when we talk about skimming, this is when we start off at a very, very high price in the marketplace, a super price premium. And then over time, the price kind of comes to a more median market demand, market level pricing. Price skimming tends to happen with technology products. It tends to happen with products that have high R&D costs, uh, new product development, because you need to make up for those costs. Price skimming tends to happen in the, with the innovators and early adopters in the early part of the product life cycle. Market penetration pricing happens when a market is already developed and you need market share fast. And in order to penetrate the market, you probably have to drop at a very, very low price to convince customers to buy. And then over time, after they trust your brand and after they trust your product, you'll slowly start increasing price to a more median level with the rest of the products in the marketplace. We tend to do market penetration pricing with um, 
late majority products that are already past growth and probably in maturity or very, very late growth. A good example of market penetration pricing is when the Lexus was introduced to the United States marketplace in 1989. Um, when the Lexus came out, it came out at $35,000, the flagship large sedan. And at the time, they were competing with the 5 Series BMW and the E-Class Mercedes, which were at least twelve, if not $15,000 more for a comparatively sized car with almost the same amount of features. Lexus needed market share fast. They needed market share to establish the brand. So they went in with a market penetration strategy. Um, the opposite example of this is the Toyota Prius example. They didn't really price skim, but they had to come in at a pretty high price compared to the rest of the market. But almost all technology products pretty much are price skimming products. Look at TVs, you know, think of OLED for two years ago when OLED TVs were like four or five grand a piece. Now we're starting to see OLED in the $1,500 to $2,000 range. Soon we're going to see 4K OLED in the $1,000 range. Maybe not by this Christmas, but soon thereafter. That's a price skimming strategy. Okay. Finally, as we wrap up the pricing module, we have pricing tactics aimed at consumers. Believe it or not, this is really part of the promo P, but we're giving you a little bit of flavor. We, as we've said multiple times, all the four P's is our marketing strategy, and they do overlap quite a bit. But we can do quantity discounts, we can do seasonal discounts, we can do couponing, all these things impact final price at consumers. We can do rebates. Con coupons happens at the transaction. Rebates tend to happen after the transaction. You have to sign in for it or send for it. Sometimes you don't buy outright, you lease. Sometimes you buy one thing and at a slightly increased price you get another when two things are bundled together. Uh, sometimes we go for a premium and we go for leader pricing. Um, all these things impact price for consumers. The same thing can happen for B2B, right? Ways to impact price. Sure, there could be seasonal discounts. Uh, this is a big one, cash discounts, okay? Which go along something along the, in my accounting people in class, would get this. A cash discount is if you pay me within 30 days, I will give you a discount in cash back. Um, they look like 210 net 30. In other words, I'll give you a 10% discount, no, 2% discount if you pay within the first 10 days of the cycle. If not, you owe me the balance within 30, 210 net 30. Sometimes it's 210. 220 net 30 or 220 net 45 you know these are cash discounts Walmart is the king of cash discounts which is one of the ways they keep dropping prices they're more about volume okay um, vendor allowances you know so in other words we think about crest okay you can't really change the price of crest but you know Procter & Gamble will go to Target and say, well, look, if you put us in the front page of the circular, we'll give you uh, $50,000 per major market to advertise on national television. Um, they could give them special displays. They can give them special in-store giveaways or swag. This is all vendor allowance type stuff. Quantity discounts, self-explanatory. If you buy more, I'll give you a better price. And then when we talk about the supply chain and the pr place P, we can talk about discounts pertaining to the logistics and distribution of goods and services. Uniform delivered means same price no matter where it is in the world versus zone pricing. You know, the further you are from the manufacturing plan or the further I have to ship something to you, the more you're going to pay for it. Okay, relatively straightforward. As you can see, all these P's are starting to kind of meld together a little bit. Thank you for your time. We'll chat more. Stop recording.